Thank you, Billy, and everyone. Yes, I have been here on occasion. <laughs> In fact, several occasions over a rather long period of time. And I find it as a wonderful and grateful and blessed opportunity when I get the opportunity to deliver a message to what now I call and Bonnie and I call our home church where our boys grew up and were part of the Govins community and had many great adventures uh, in part of the youth group and activities and where we have too. Today is kind of a special day for me, not necessarily for you, but it's an anniversary. For you see, it just so happens, and I got this invitation without anyone knowing, <laughs> that's exactly 50 years almost to the day, it would be tomorrow, but let's just say as of this day, it's 50 years since I was ordained to the gospel ministry. And I want to share with you at this time some of what that means to me and what I have come to understand lately as I go on my eternal pilgrim path that God calls us all to journey on, growing in discipleship each step and day that we have. I asked Leah to sing Precious Lord, for it speaks to me of the aching in my heart and perhaps yours for the times we live in. It's an older hymn and many people have used it during trying times to cry out to the one we need beyond all the many to comfort us, to guide us, to lead us in the ways that God would have us go as his disciples. I have a long path, as you might indicate. You know, by the time you get ordained, you have to go through a lot of education. I was in my mid-twenties by then, so you can do the figures of how old that means that I really am and that struggle. One of the things I want to speak about today is my own journey in terms of participating in the life of this country and of seeking the American dream of equality for all. Now, I could tell you that, yeah, I got my ticket punched way back in the 60s in a little bit of participation in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and other things to proclaim that this country and our life and in the church could be better. And I thought I'd come along, you know. I mean, it's been a long time I've been engaged in trying to understand what's a problem at the heart of this country. But I have a confession to make. Lately, I have found that I must go even deeper. Bonnie and I went a little over, over a year ago, back in January of 2020, on a civil rights to our last trip before COVID hit and journeyed through different places on the civil rights tour in the South. And we ended up in Montgomery, Alabama, both at the lynching memorial, which was overwhelming, and then at a museum that sought to trace how the racism that was there from the beginning with slavery continues even to this day. And I was looking at the different exhibits and, you know, taking it in, and then it was like lightning hit me. There was a picture of this small town in South Carolina, Abbeville, and it was about a lynching that had gone on there centuries ago. But the lightning was, for me, I had been on Ancestry.com tracing back the Harris family and the Wade family on my mother's side. And the Harris family, it turns out, in the early 1700s resided in Abbeville, South Carolina. 
My heritage was connected. Then I saw another picture, and it was another shock. It was of Waco, Texas, and it was of a lynching that happened in the 1930s, and there was a crowd, they said, of almost 20,000, more than the population of Waco at that time, that were there looking on, this massive crowd of white folks. My father and his brothers and sisters and parents grew up and lived in Mark, Texas, which is just outside of Waco. Waco was the big town that they went to. And I had to reflect, were any of my kinfolk somewhere buried in that picture? I do not know. But nevertheless, I know their attitudes might be in some harmony with that. I can't lay that all on them. Maybe they were appalled, but their views were not far removed, if they were at all. I'd like to share, if we can, slide one, if someone's doing that. I've got it. Slide one comes, if you'll see up here in the corner, from Maya Angelou. What it says that gives me a little bit of hope is do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. Well, that's kind of what I say to myself and hope that she says that something good for all of us who are disciples and follow the path and know that we need to grow and understand more deeply and act more powerfully and what God calls us to do. And that understanding and that enlargement of that understanding never ends. That brings me today to talk to you about a construct that may illuminate one of the key things that we need to address in our society and now have more opportunity than we've ever had to do. And that is what I call today and want to frame it that way is our original sin. Now, original sin is difficult theology, and we often like to avoid it. And as Billy referred to, in the Presbyterian Church, we have the prayer of confession, and we get confused because it means that we act like we're the dregs of the earth, and that's not what it's about at all. It's about being honest and facing the truth of who we are and that we can grow, and that we can do better. Whenever you think of how problematic that prayer of confession is, you might think of our book of confessions. But anyway, it doesn't change the fact that you don't have to go to, oh, it's all about that Adam ate that apple, or what Calvin would have you understanding, or a lot of other people about what is original sin. Let me frame it for you in a way that I hope you can get a hold of. It simply means that out of our fear, we have a tendency, rather than opening our hearts to that which is at the center, either the divine spark or we in the Presbyterian church would say that openness to letting God fill us through the Holy Spirit. We're scared and we can't quite get there to trust that God will take care of us like the lilies of the field. And so we stop short and we begin to construct what would make us feel safe in our anxiety. Something short, a penultimate kind of place that turns into idolatry. We make a part of what God's reality is the whole. We don't see that all of life, all of God's creation is interconnected and we're a part of it all. And there is no us and them. There is only the family of God. And that is our struggle. That's the human struggle. Out of free will, we have that opportunity. And because of our anxiousness, 
and wanting to glom onto something we can get our hands around. We get into trouble, resulting in hatred, violence, tribalism, on and on, war, oppression, all sorts of evil that we personally might be involved in or our group might be involved in, or yes, even our whole country. That is our original sin of our country, pre, pre its existence even as a nation was racial injustice and white supremacy. It began in 1619 when the first slaves were brought to America. Now I'm not going into specifics today. We have ways in this congregation of really engaging and reading material is all over the place for you. You can join the Gowans Book Club and read things such as White Fragility, Cast, or the new book that we're going to read now, Kindred, and others that we have read. Or you can go to the New York Times project of 1619 and read a whole host of essays. We have the opportunity today to really dig and face that truth. Yet, as you well know, we struggle. And there are those who say, ah, forget all that. Let's just look forward. You can't go forward unless you come to terms from how you got to where you are. Coming later in September, you're going to hear a lot about the Racial Justice Ministry Working Group. Lee, I can't believe I got that out right. <laughs> but we're going to be involved in ways to get deeper into this and understanding that the white church is the bastion of white supremacy and we need a prophetic voice to help us deal with that. That brings us to today's gospel lesson. I remember preaching my first sermon and I also remember that at least one woman said to our pastor, I can't believe that young man preached that in Jim Carroll's church. Jim Carroll, Reverend Jim Carroll, the senior pastor, said to her, I didn't know it was my church. I thought it was Jesus' church. Amen to him and saving me a lot of embarrassment. But be that as it may, I still wonder what was Jesus thinking? He goes to his home church. That's what it says. And they invite him as I understand, he's someone of learning and has impressed people with his understanding to read some of the scripture and reflect on it. So notice what Jesus picks. They give him the prophet Isaiah and Jesus looks through it and he finds this passage that we often might think is secondary. He lists it as primary in terms of what he and the gospel, the good news, are all about. That God, from time immemorial, has been concerned about the oppressed, the downtrodden, the poor, those who were overlooked, those who do not have the life, the abundant life that God intends for us all. And the good news begins there. And then Jesus does himself in by saying, today, this has been fulfilled. The gospel is here alive. Well, he steps into that trap of doing the prophetic voice, that full, powerful voice that lifts up God's message to all of us. And we have trouble. And they ran him out of town. You didn't hear that part that follows. They got so upset they tried to kill him and he got away, but in essence, he was run out of his hometown, his home synagogue. They didn't want to hear it. And we have the same trouble. That brings us to an understanding that we need to get into if we understand the gospel in its fullness. And that is difficult for us in a church. We're ready for the second slide. And that is what I call, and it's important, God's ripple effect. 
It's as if at times God would just drop a little bit of his healing water, like in baptism, into us. Like a stone or bubble falling, ripple of water falling into a pond. But what happens? It begins to radiate outward. Yes, it fills us with joy and understanding that God's grace is for you and me. And then it goes further, and we sort of get on to that. Yeah, it goes to us in interpersonal relationships and relationships with our family. And yeah, with our church and with our neighborhood and with our group. But like the ripple effect here, this metaphor, God's will and power doesn't stop there. It keeps going and going and going until, as we heard in the psalm, it includes all of the universe, all of God's creation, and affects it in every corner. And we need to understand that we're a wonderful part of that whole. But we struggle with that. And we struggle with that ripple effect. And we have the problem that Thomas B. Jones says in White Too Long, that if you want to get to the absolute bastion of racism and white supremacy in this country, you have to turn and look at the white church. And the reason when I grew up that we stopped with personal salvation and so many of us in the church do that it's in us and maybe in our relationships instead of going beyond to the structures of our society and the culture of our society is because it's embarrassing. It has us encounter some of our sin about how we are involved in something evil called white supremacy. Next slide, please. And this is, if you can read this, Billy, because my screen has this block in the middle. It's a quote by Howard Thurman. By some amazing but vastly creative spiritual insight, the slave undertook the redemption of a religion that the master had profaned in his midst. What it was, and we all celebrate the spirituals and the knowledge, that if you listen to those words, and yes, they were talking about the sweet by and by, it sounds like, but no, they were talking about that God brought slaves out of Egypt and gave them a promised land, and that they were to inherit that. They were to get the freedom that is constantly revealed in Scripture again and again and who God is concerned for. And they got it. It wasn't just after they died, if they had been saved personally. It was about this is what God intended for our society, for our country. So don't mistake that step one is essential. We often do that in the liberal progressive church and move right on to social justice. But that's another trap I could go into another time. So how do we respond to that? What do we do? What is our path? Come on, give us a cookbook, if you will. Well, we have one. It's been with us for 2,000 years. We have it in the basic liturgy of the church. And while it's not as recognizable as the ancient liturgy or the Roman Catholic liturgy, the Episcopal one, or even our own book of common worship these days, it's still all there as we saw today. We start by a call to worship, a call to understand that the Holy One is here present if we would tune in. And that that Holy One is the one that calls us, unites us, saves us, and sells and we celebrate that reality. Then we move to confession. We move to understand that we must 
if you will, just be truthful, just have integrity. Why, if we're in the presence of God, to acknowledge who we are and who we are not. What we have done that we shouldn't have done and what we haven't done that we should do. It's not to deprecate ourselves, it's just to say we are finite people that are incomplete without God living that one beyond all the many in our middle. And then instead of being judged or condemned, we find that if we will acknowledge that, God will give us his grace, her grace, and it will fill us. If we can open up and touch that broken place, that incomplete place, what we find is if we can be honest about it, we don't have death. We have life come to us and fill us and grace. And I promise you, if you can do that in your heart, I promise you, you will experience that. I guarantee it. We get forgiveness and we get a call to move forward. So then we listen to scripture and listen to words and remember that it's not what the preacher says, it's but how you respond in your heart to what you like or don't like. And you can very much disagree and say, no, God's saying something different than that minister or David Harris up here talking. But it'll still put you in touch by giving you something to interact with. We discern what God would say to us and where God calls for us to go. And we tremble at that hard path. So we also have, like we do today, the sacrament to feed us, to give us strength. And no, we never go alone. And then in that offering that comes, we make a commitment to repentance and the ministry of reconciliation. And we go out into the world with a blessing and a benediction that God goes with us. We're not alone in this. It's not just up to our paltry strength. But rather we go with the Holy Spirit and it's powerful, powerful gospel and energy and ripple effect. We go with hope into the world as he and the prophets and Jesus always remind us. We grow and participate in the bringing to reality God's kingdom. Kingdom. Family. Now, I've put together a slide you just briefly saw. Let's look at it again. And I want to put this in lay people's terms. I'm going to put it in the terms that Desmond Tutu and others did in truth and reconciliation processes for South Africa and Rwanda where they had had massive genocide and what they used. And here it is. It fits with the liturgy. First and foremost, we must face the truth. Then we must confess or own our part in it, the good and the bad and the ugly. Knowing that God's grace then comes and forgiveness and we have the opportunity for repentance and moving into a ministry of reconciliation with each other and come in contact with that interconnectedness of all. It is us, not a we or a them, but all of us together as God's children. And what do we find but community? I like to say it as Martin Luther King said it, the blessed community. What God intends for all of us and what we must find in this world as we see so much destruction going in and even God's very creation is threatened and maybe the end of us all. But blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. That's the vision we have. And you know, the American vision in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution really can be enlarged without changing the words to unite with that vision. Amen.